So indeed, so the subject of my lecture series is not contact homology, and so this is some subject um, that we studied for a uh, number of years. And uh, in some sense, it can be viewed as applications of, of uh, this symplectic field theory package to uh, knot theory, or more generally, uh, to uh, you know differential topology. So um, <clears throat> the the series will have three parts. So today I'm going to give some kind of introduction, defining uh, not contact homology in particular, but starting by talking about the short. Legendrian contact homology, which is part of this uh, symplectic field theory uh, package, and then try to get to the point where you can actually get the feeling for how you would compute these things uh, more concretely, not just uh, showing that the theory exists, but actually compute it. And then uh, <coughs> uh, tomorrow, no, maybe not tomorrow, but the second lecture, uh, I, I will talk about, probably continue with that, and then talk about uh, relation to string topology. And finally, in the third lecture, I'm going to talk about relations to more physical theories, so like Chern-Simons and, and, and uh, topological string uh, theory. Um, there was kind of more recent developments of the subject over the last few years. So, but anyway, so let, let me start by uh, giving an in kind of some introductory remarks about the relation between differential topology And, and symplectic symplectic geometry or contact geometry. So there is a, somehow this basic uh, basic thing that if, if you have a smooth manifold M, then it has a, a cotangent bundle, which is a, a symplectic manifold, in fact, a <coughs> Weinstein manifold, so exact symplectic manifold. And one may now ask the question, how much of the smooth topology, or just the topology first of M, does the symplectic geometry of this T star M remember? So, uh, and, and the, f the first, uh, so I, I'm not going to explain these results. I'm just going to state them so they see where, where, what we are going to do fit in. So, so if you have uh, <coughs> a symplectomorphism between T star M, uh, and some other T star or some other manifold N, then uh, if, you look, if you look at the zero section in here, M, that sits in there as a Lagrangian submanifold, and the image of that would be an exact Lagrangian submanifold in T star N. And there's a theorem uh, which has some history, but somehow the, this full version is due, due to a Boseid and Krog. And it says that if, if uh, L is an exact Lagrangian submanifold in T star M, then uh, there is a simple homotopy equivalence between L and the zero section. Um, so, so in fact, uh, the, the homotopy type of, of the zero section is remembered by the symplectic Topology. And this proof goes via Fleur homology with, with local coefficients. Is somehow there is some uh, history to this theorem that I want to tell you about, but there certainly were lots of uh, contributions. Maybe it's compact? Uh, compact, yes. So, sorry. L, 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 M, <coughs> M and L are closed, closed manifolds. So that's right. So uh, compact, no boundary. So so the next question is, does this sort of go beyond? Would, would the symplectic geometry feel anything more than the homotopy type? And the answer, again, is yes. So uh, the, maybe the easiest starting point for such theorem is to start when, when M, in fact, sort of has no homotopy theory. So that would mean that M is a homotopy sphere. And then there is a theorem that builds on <coughs> the first theorem in this he kind of uh, spirit was due to is, is due to Abu Said again, but this theorem is in a paper by myself and Krog and Smith and Smith, and it says the following that um, uh, 
that if, if sigma and sigma prime are odd dimensional homotopy spheres, Uh, and, and if the cotangent bundle of sigma is symplectomorphic to the cotangent bundle of sigma prime, uh, then uh -huh. yeah. then uh, sigma uh, is uh, I don't know the class of sigma in the in the in the class of homotopy spheres there are equal uh, modulo boundary parallelizable uh, sphere. So in, in this dimension, the uh, 2k minus 1 perhaps, all dimensions of 2k. So um, in, when you look at this is some kind of classical differential topology, which I won't talk much about, but, but if you have a Homotopy spheres, they found that they, they form this age coborism group, and inside there there's a subgroup, the bound boundary parallelizable manifolds, and, and we know that they are uh, that that their cotangent bundle can, can be equal symplectic manifold only if they're equal modulo this boundary parallelizable one. So so the huh? thank you. Um, which corresponds to changing the orientation of sigma. So this is sort of not so serious. Okay, anyway, so, um, so this theorem tells you that in fact the symplectic geometry of the cotangent bundle is pretty sensitive. And I would say that the proof that I'm not going to talk about but goes beyond, uh, you know, Fleur theory and SFT and the like. It's kind of different version where you use a moduli space of holomorphic curves not just as to, to get some fundamental cycle or something like that, but it's actually it's a K-theory class of it or, or you know, something like that. So, so basic, basically you're, you're using the moduli space more than you're using things derived from it. So it, it's somehow a very interesting uh, way of using moduli spaces, but here it's a little bit ad hoc used. So it's, it's very hard to use it directly, and so I encourage everybody to think hard about this um, and see if you can find maybe the expectation for what is the how could it so, be sharpened? Yeah, so the the sharpest expectation, or the, this is this uh, nearby Lagrangian conjecture, that will say that any exact Lagrangian sitting inside here actually is Hamiltonian isotopic to zero section. You still believe in this? Do you, do you believe in this? I'm not so sure, but then uh, somehow you should ask Thomas Krog. So he's uh, kind of the He's the leading disbeliever, I think. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. So, for example, uh, yeah, I, I will I will mention something in in, in one second in this direction. So um, now, what, what we are going to talk about is not this, but we're going to talk about a relative version of that. So, if you have a submanifold. Uh, k inside the manifold, so again, closed, everything is closed, then we can associate the symplectic geometric object also to that. So, and the natural thing is to take the Lagrangian co-normal uh, inside the cotangent bundle of M. And what we are going to do is related to that, but we're also going to look at the Lagrangian co-normal. So I'll define this in, in one second. Inside the unit cotangent bundle of M viewed as a contact Manifold. So uh, the Lagrangian co-normal is uh, the set of, of points in the cotangent bundle. So Q is along the, its coordinate along the base, and P is the corresponding fiber coordinate. So that Q is in in the submanifold, and P, when you restrict it to the tangent space at this Q is equal zero. So it's somehow exactly the normal, normal vectors uh, of k, but thought of as in line in the fiber direction. So these are obviously Lagrangians of manifold. And, uh, <coughs> and the Lagrangian thing is this just Lk intersected with, say, the unit cotangent bundle 
you fix the Riemannian metric. Uh, and that's a Legendrian submanifold. And, and what we are going to do is actually we're going to specialize quite, quite a bit more. So we are going to, for, so for this lecture series, we take k to be a naught uh, in m, which is equal to r3 most of the time, and sometimes perhaps s3. It doesn't make much difference. So, so we, we will study a very special, a special case of this. But before we go to this special case and then and I define the holomorphic curve theories, et cetera, that we are going to use, it's worth mentioning um, some results uh, about this stuff and see how, how well it works with respect to things like this, this theorem. And uh, there, so one should say, and that's maybe kind of a good reason for talking about this, that the, the, this theory, so when you apply the holomorphic, the SFT package or some part of it, to this lambda k, then it's quite successful. So for example, as we will see, the theory detects the unknot. So the, the, it will be, I'll explain this. So there will be a dj associated to any knot, and this dj looks like that of the unknot exactly only when it is the unknot and for no other knots. And it is a pretty, pretty nice uh, knot invariant that knows about things like a polynomial of the knot, and et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but, but let's first consider somehow this counterpart to this in high dimensions, where um, there was uh, some observations uh, recently made by uh, Dimitri Rissell and then another student of mine, uh, Eriksson Östman, and, and uh, it's the following. So if you start in, in R6, then in R6 you can embed three spheres, so there is the standard three sphere and the knot theory here, in fact, is pretty simple. So if you, if you appeal topologist uh, or C0 topologist, or maybe no, Lipschitz topologist maybe, or so kind of if you're Lipschitz topologist, then there is only kind of one uh, knot class. But there is uh, an integer worth of smooth knots. And uh, the, <coughs> the invariant can be seen as follows. So you take this, this embedding of the S3 in R6, and then you'd find a four-dimensional ciphered surface embedded, and you take its uh, signature. So the signature is some kind of multiple by of 16, and then you can realize all these knots. So there are these knots, three, three knots in five space, which are actually differentially noted, but PL standard. So one might ask, would this lambda k, so, so, so k, so this is k, c thing. So what about this lambda k, which is now the co-normal of, of S3? And topologically, so it's an S, it's the boundary of, like the boundary of tubular neighbors, it's S2 times S3. Um, does, does this lambda k remember uh, smooth knottiness? Is that six or five? This is six. So the, the boundaries would be in S2, right? So lambda k is, is diffeomorphic to S3, S3 times S2, right? So it's a trivial normal bundle. Then. No? Okay. Yeah. And the answer is no. Um, because, um, in fact, it does not. Uh, and, and why is that? So uh, the observation is that actually, so you see, uh, so let me draw the knot and then take this tubular neighborhood, boundary of tubular neighborhood. Now, the co-normal lift can also be somehow, it's clearly isotopic to the co-normal lift with the outward normal of this boundary of a tubular neighborhood, right? It doesn't matter if you, if, if you lift right on the knot, or you fatten it up and lift a little bit along other vectors. And in fact, the, 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 tube, the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the knot, k, and of the standard one, even though the knots are not isotopic, the boundaries of tubular neighborhoods are isotopic. So this is some kind of just a consequence of H. Coburdison theorem, or Smale's handle cancellation. So, so here you can you can define a function, uh, Morse function on S, if you put S6 instead of R6, so, 
So you have a, a minimum here and an index three handle here. And so the, the complement of that, if you, you can cancel all the critical points, so that means that the complement looks like an S2 times a D4. So somehow the, the complement retracts into an S2 sitting here, and, and the S2 is completely free in R6, right? Because it's 2 plus 2 is too little. So, so that means that you can isotope this tubular neighborhood to that tubular neighborhood, and therefore you can isotope lambda k to lambda s3. On the other hand, and this, this is somehow interesting open question, so the secret to this is that this, this weird note, the Heffliger note, it actually lives here somehow in a tubular, on the boundary of a tubular neighborhood. And one could, for, for example, ask the question that if you pick one of these Lachandrian isotopes, anyone, would it have to take, could it take a section of this kind of normal bundle into a section of the other one? And probably, I would guess the answer is no. So, so that it still knows about this, but, but it doesn't, it's somehow it's some parameterization question, right? And does the Lachandrian isotope have to really mess up the parameterization? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. if that's not true, does it break this nearby uh, Legendrian conjecture? No, no. It doesn't break really anything. But for the nearby Lagrangian conjecture, I think the great question is if... So now, this is in R6, and, and, and if you think about this T star S3, that's also a six-dimensional thing. And you have more or less the counterparts of this you have the zero section, you have kind of a Heffliger counterpart of zero section and so on. And I think it's unknown if, if they are represented by Lagrangian embeddings. So I think this is a reasonable question. Can you find Lagrangian S3 in the isotopy class of the Heffliger sphere in T star S3? So that, and that would certainly break the conjecture, but maybe it's not that easy, so I don't know. Uh, well. Uh, Okay, so th this was the uh, end, end of the introduction almost, uh, but one could maybe say here that one of the things that little bit go wrong here is that the co-dimension co is too big. So when you're in co-dimension two, then certainly this non cotank tomology, exactly as in the case of knots in R3, will be pretty powerful because it fills a lot of properties of the fundamental group of the, of the complement. So okay. Um, but that's uh, enough of... of uh, of introduction to the general area. So we, we will now study this not contact homology. Think of the fact that Bendicate doesn't remember smooth knottiness as a shadow of the, as a shadow of the fact that there's no PL knottiness. Yeah, I mean it is. So here it is. But uh, so what I suspect is that uh, is that lambda k, not as a submanifold, but as a parameterized submanifold, as a parameterized Lachandrian submanifold, does remember smooth knottiness. That would be my guess. And that, that's, of course, I don't know how to prove, otherwise I'd give some other talk, but, okay, so. <laughs> um, you were saying that the smooth modding is distinguished by the signature of the cipher surfaces? Uh -huh. So if you take those cipher surfaces and put those in the, like the, the cotangent bundle, then what? Yeah, so, so, they, so here you wouldn't quite have a cipher surface, but you would have a, a surface going, so if you have, a, so here's your S3, and then you have your, Strange knot. So, so there you would have a four manifold interpolating between the two, and you could take the signature of that. So that would be the that would be the counterpart of this Heffliger signature, I think. Uh, but but this is just you're just assuming now the knots are smooth, and then you're asking, can you actually find a Lagrangian representative so that this cobordism has non-trivial signature, and that's. Uh, if you can, you're famous. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to describe for you uh, Lechandrian contact homology in a, in a setting which is sufficient for, for what we are going to do later, but not completely in this uh, uh, unit called tangent bundle of R3, but I will start out a little bit more generally. So, so why is a contact, contact 2n minus 1 manifold? And, and the contact form alpha is the contact one form. And inside this Y, we have a, a Lechandrian submanifold. <coughs> and, uh, and, and what is this Lechandrian DGA? So, so we'll define. Uh, Lechandrian DJ uh, can, is part of SFT. Uh, so if you want to just, before I go into details, what is it? Well, it is the attempt, it is the answer to the following question. You try to do some kind of Fleur homology on the path space, so gamma, uh, So here is lambda, and here is lambda, and this is a path gamma taking lambda to itself. And you try to do the Fleur homology for the action functional, which sends such path gamma to the action. And then uh, you, <coughs> sorry, you cannot quite do it, and, and somehow the, these SFT type splittings that you see forces you to use some other algebraic structure than, than just a, a chain complex. And that's, that's what I'm going to, to uh, explain. So, for, so since this is a lot of kind of uh, technical business going on, so, so, so let me be precise. So, so we, will, we will restrict to, so we assume that there are no, no closed orbits. And in, uh, in, in Y, uh, which, is, which is the case, right, for the unit cotangent bundle of R3. Uh, maybe not for unit content bundle S3, but, but anyway. And we will also assume uh, that the first churn class of the, of the uh, contact plane field <coughs> uh, is zero. And I think that I will assume that this Y is simply connected. And uh, what else? I'll probably assume that the mass... I was about to ask whether local, no contractible closed orbit would be enough. But since it would be, it would be, it would be. But I, I, I want to somehow to get the things over. Maybe, I, maybe it's zero. Okay, <laughs> what you prefer. Okay, so and then um, and and I will also so that I, I'll talk about this Maslow class. But I'll take the Maslow class of lambda to be zero, to have the theory graded. Are these assumptions really necessary, or to just? To make it easier to explain. It's, it's, it's just to make it easier to explain. So they are not necessary, and uh, s some of them are slightly serious. So uh, these, these two things affect the grading. So you'd have to do some, some, something about the grading. Uh, right, so this, this is somehow is the serious, uh, the serious assumption. And what would happen is I, I will now define for you an algebra which is just generated by quartz, and it will be an algebra over some coefficient ring. But if there are orbits, then the Lechandrian algebra would be an algebra over the contact homology orbit algebra that, I, that I'm not going to talk about. And that orbit algebra certainly does require a lot more of machinery of the nature that's being discussed here about polyphones or something like that, so abstract perturbations. Whereas this, what we're doing here, we can actually get away without uh, we get away with the classic, I mean, with classical perturbation theory. Okay. Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, right. I'm probably forgetting half the, some more assumption, but it doesn't matter. So, so, so what is this thing? So, what, what we are going to do is we, we, first we have the, the Rabe, Rabe vector field. We'll probably. You already discussed this, right? So this is somehow 
in the kernel of <coughs> the alpha and normalizing so that it's equal to 1. And so the generators of our algebra will be rave chords. So they will be <coughs> chords with endpoints on lambda. And the algebra itself, so A of lambda uh, will be uh, the following. So it will be an algebra over the group ring of the second um, homology of y relative lambda uh, and generated by rave chords. And well, I should say, it's a un so this is a unital algebra generated by rave chords. And this, no, this algebra is not commutative in any way. So kind of rave chord A times rave chord B is not rave chord B times rave chord A. So it's just like that. And <coughs> this is, uh, it's a... Uh, the H2Y lambda classes, they commute with the rave chords? Uh, yeah, so, so right now, so for, for the first verse, I wanted to say this is a kind of simple version. So I will first take them to commute. It's not really necessary. So you can soup this up, and we will do that tomorrow. But for now, I will take the coefficients just to commute with all the rave cores. But it's not really necessary. So this could be like some kind of module where you can put these things in between, and they don't necessarily commute. And we'll see geometric reason why, why you can do such things in a little while. OK. So this is the this is the so we are defining a DGA and we just define the A kind of so now the G so the grading so grading uh, so here here is a chord C and so what we do we pick a path inside the Lagrangian uh, so this is some path inside lambda. And now, since y was simply connected, we could somehow extend. We can fill it in with, with a disk. right? And now, on the boundary of this disk, we have the tangent spaces of lambda giving a field of Lagrangian planes in the contact plane field. And when you have that, uh, that path, you somehow you can take the tangent space of lambda at the end point and transport it to the starting point with the linearized rave flow and you get a, a, almost a closed path. You have to close it up somehow uh, by positive rotation and you take the Maslow index of that or, or, or the condescender index. So let, let me, I'll explain in examples how you compute this later. So, so anyway, the, uh, yeah, the grading of, of C is equal to uh, the Conley Sender index of this C, which is this Maslow index I was talking about, minus one. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this. It's just you have to think about this is somehow related to the homotopy class of, of these Lagrangian plane fields, and this is what normally enters into grading um, when you compute these indices. So, okay. Uh, so, so. So we have an idea about the grading, at least. And now, uh, what is the differential? This is, of course, the most important piece of the algebra. So, so first, we fix, fix on. Uh, uh, so, so, so first, we consider, as was done before here. We consider the symplectization r times y. Uh, and here we take the symplectic form dE to the t alpha. I guess everybody saw this before. And we fix, fix an almost complex structure, uh, j, which is translation, translation invariant, uh, and takes the contact plane field to itself and, and somehow this j of, of the extra t direction is equal to the ray direction. So this, this probably everybody, you probably talked about this, right? Yeah, or no? Oh, yeah, 
so, so, this so, was multiple covers. <laughs> this was multiple covers, that's good. So, yeah, I don't know if you should divide by <laughs> one factorial or just divide by how many times it was mentioned. But anyway, so let's, okay. Um, okay, so, 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 so you, you can re recognize this thing. And then, uh, oops, sorry. And then uh, we have this notion, again, probably multiple covered, of finite energy. So we have the energy, or omega energy, so it's an area in the contact planes. And then we have sort of this cutoff area in the kind of, here we go, alpha energy, but maybe lambda energy in some other talk. So, so going in this, this other direction where you have to take a cutoff function. And then, uh, as probably was discussed, at least in the case of orbits, we, we know that the finite, so, so uh, finite energy curves, so I'm just stating this a little bit imprecise. So finite energy curves, uh, uh, holomorphic disks is enough, uh, are asymptotic to ray cord strips. At punctures. So, so indeed, note that by, by this requirement, if you take the just rape chord C times R, then this is a holomorphic strip. With, with these are the trivial strips, which counterparts are trivial cylinders from Helmut's talk. And now, if you have any such finite energy disk, let's say, mapping in there, then it has a number of positive punctures, a number of negative punctures, where it's asym strongly, exponentially asymptotic to this uh, disk provided that all the rave cores are, are non-degenerate. Okay, <clears throat> and the moduli spaces that we will use, they are moduli spaces of a specific kind of disks with one positive and several negative punctures. <clears throat> for a rape cord, cord A, and the word of rape cords B underline, which is B1 up to Bm, uh, the, we, we consider the moduli space M sub A, which is, this is, I'll explain what A is in a minute, A B <coughs> is the moduli space of holomorphic disks uh, on the following form. So this disk has one positive puncture at A. And it has several negative punctures, which appear when you go around the disk as B1, B2, B3, and then finally Bm, right? So that, that's, that's, that's determining this word. And finally, uh, remember that we have these capping disks. So we can somehow take a little disk here, a little disk here, here. They, they're just, we just choose them, it's up there. We, for each chord, we choose such a disk. So when we fill it in by these capping disks, then this uh, creature, the holomorphic disks and the capping disks, they define a homology class inside H2, right? Relative. So that's, a, that's what this, this guy is. So, <clears throat> so this is the moduli space we'll use. And the dimension, uh, the formal dimension of this M, a, in our case, is simply equal to the grading of A minus the grading of B, which is the sum of the gradings of the factors in B. Okay, so, so the differential that we are going to define is simply defined by counting such things in one-dimensional moduli spaces, so the kind of minimal dimension. Something interesting happens, so because, as you've heard about this R invariant, somehow the mi minimal 
dimension of an interesting disk is uh, one. And so the differential from this algebra to itself, maybe I have lambda, uh, uh, satisfies Leibniz rule. Uh, and is linear on coefficients, so coefficients just go through. Um, and on generators, it's defined as d of a is the sum over uh, a minus b equals 1. And then number of r families in this moduli space times the word b. And maybe I put here e to the a, so indicating we're in the group ring. OK. And then, uh, so, so this is the definition of the, of the differential. And then we have the expected theorems. So, uh, so d squared is equal to 0. Uh, and and uh, uh, AD. Let me not say too much about this. Is is invariant up to homotopy uh, under deformations? Uh, let's say under Lagrangian isotopy of lambda. So, so in the case uh, that we need it, so in the case when the ambient space is a one-jet manifold, uh, <coughs> one-jet space, as, as we will see the, the unit cotangent bundle of R3 is, um, this uh, theorem was actually sort of fully proved in work of myself and Etnair and Sullivan. Um, so, so, and, and that you can do without using abstract perturbations for for some reasons, that maybe I'll see if I get to explain it. Otherwise, if you can explain, maybe during discussion. So, so what it says is that if you if you pick this J generic, then d squared equals zero, and uh, and also when you deform the thing, you get uh, homotopy. Um, one one would need to say what is this homotopy, but in particular, in particular, the homology of the thing is invariant on this. Okay. Sorry, Tobias. Uh, a is the energy. No, a, a. Sorry, A is the. This A is the. It's. It's the algebra. No, uh, in the formula for the differential, we have yeah. e to the a. Uh, e to the a, a. A A here. Yeah, right. This is just stupid notation for. So A is in. In H two. Y lambda, and then I write somehow, e to the a for the same thing in in the group ring, right? Okay. So, so th this is some integer number, and then times this thing. So it lives in the grouping. So it's just you can think if you want. You can think about it. It's just a. This is okay. Right. Okay. So let's consider uh, the simplest example of this theory that that was also the first somehow uh, that was discovered. It's called the chekhanov ilyashberg algebra of a knot, the only knot in R three. So. So consider the ambient manifold to be R3 with the standard contact structure dc minus y dx. So here, uh, a Lagrangian knot is a knot which lies in the kernel of this thing. And so in particular, when you project it, so I should say first that the rave, the rave is just here, the, the vertical vector field in the z direction. So when you project the Lagrangian knot into xy space, then it projects to some, if you take it generic, it has double points. And it bounds zero area. If you kind of take the y dx integral, it's zero. And, <clears throat> and the rave cores are very easy to spot. So, so they just correspond to, to uh, double points, right? Because it's in c direction. And now, 
one can pick the almost complex structure to be the pullback. So the contact plane field projects, uh, you know, onto this plane so that it is uh, nothing, I don't know what this is, a uh, bijection, I don't know. It, Tony Ng has beautiful pictures on his website. Great. So, but anyway, so it's a, it's a isomorphism on this plane, right? So, kind of, so, so therefore, you can take uh, the standard complex structure here and pull it back to the contact planes. And therefore, you can read off holomorphic curves in the symplectization by projecting them down and see that they project to curves in here. So, in fact, uh, it's possible to compute here by the following. So, we need to distinguish what is a positive puncture and a negative puncture. So, uh, and the rule is that at positive puncture, the holomorphic curve goes up the rabe cord, and at negative punctures, it goes down. So here you have such decoration. And then the differential counts holomorphic polygons with convex corners. So that's somehow this index, index, index requirement, if you wish, with one positive and several negative corners. So, <coughs> so we need to say kind of a few more words to complete this, this description. Uh, so here, in this case, what is this H2 relative? That's just H1 of the knot. So there, there will be kind of one variable in the group ring. And so we fix a point on the knot. Uh, and what more? So the other thing is the signs. So here, signs uh, is the following. So the, remember that these, these uh, chords, they have a, a grading, right? So they're kind of... And in this case, I should say what the grading is. So the grading is the following. You start at the top. You go along the note. So I assume the note has mass in this. So you go along the note. You end up here, and you close it up with a positive rotation. So, so the grading of A is the twice, so that's the mass law, times the rotation number of the positive close-up. Minus 1. So, uh, and so there will be negative uh, and uh, the, the, at, the, at the even, so let's see. So, right. Sorry, the, the polygons have to be embedded or could they be immersed? They, they can be immersed uh, as long as they, they, can, they can certainly cover themselves, but they, they need no branch points. But they are immersed and they have convex corners. And then now I'm kind of getting slightly confused. But um, uh, let's see. So, so now uh, what you do in order to get the... Uh, which side? So I'm, uh, sorry. So, so somehow, I, I, I'm sorry, I should have drawn a better picture. So you somehow, you shade. So I, I'm going to explain signs. Right. So you, you shade at, at each, each even, even index crossing. You shade somehow the, <coughs> if you, if you, you shade half of the corners like this. And then in the, in the, in the disk, so you know, we're going to have to look at, at papers to get this right. But in the disk, you count the number of shaded corners with a minus one to, to something. So for example, for the unknot, there is nothing here. So what is the differential here, D of A? So this is A. First, let's see, what is the grading of A? So grading of A is 2. Uh, uh, it, it rotates once, right, when you do it. So it's a 2 minus 1, so that's 1. And, and there are two disks, two rigid disks, this one and that one. And one of them does not pass through this chosen base point, so that's a 1. And, and the other one, there are no shaded corners because there are no even, even corners at all. And the other one does pass through this base point, which means that we kind of view it as going once around the knot. So it is 1 plus, I don't know what to call it, maybe mu, which is the homology class of the knot. Right? So you see somehow that, uh, that the, the DGA of this unknot is uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, you, you, most often it's acyclic actually. But if you take mu equals minus 1, then it is not a cyclic, so it has something. 
So, um, so that's a. Uh, mu was the mass loss. Mu, mu, no, mu, sorry, mu is is the generator of h1 of 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 of, of our lambda. So this is a co this is a coefficient, right? So the, the algebra. You want q? Right. Uh, mu, uh, mu was mass. Okay, maybe I don't know. T is sometimes used. Let's put t. So t t is the generator of of h1 of lambda, which is here the relative coefficient. Okay. So uh, so I, I was kind of I'm now the time is flying here as Helmut noticed. So but anyway, so I was asked to give some exercises. So let me kind of give exercise. So exercise, of course, is to compute this for some other node. <coughs> so compute this for the trefoil. Uh, if I can draw it correctly, I'm not sure. I think that's correct. So compute. Uh, is something wrong? Yeah, from the wrong. Is topological yeah. true? Sorry, yeah. This should go down, right? Down, under, over. Like that, right? I think that looks better. Good. So, so compute uh, DJ for this, and also think a little bit. What is what is the significance here of T? So. This is, of course, a hard question, but why t is equal to minus 1 is something a kind of special thing here, and so on. OK, good. Um, good. So <laughs> the next uh, step, so, so, so we see that this theory is actually very computable in the simple case that we are in R3 or maybe the surface times R or something like that, we can compute this thing. But we are actually aiming for something a little bit higher dimensional. So we're aiming for, uh, for the unit cotangent bundle of R3, which in fact is the one jet space of S2. So the next thing I want to explain is how, how this thing can be done in one jet space. So, so one jet space. Oops. So, so <coughs> if you have a manifold M, then the one jet space of M is just a cotangent bundle thought of as, as a differential of the function times R, which is the function value. And on here, there is a nice contact structure, which is dc minus the action form PdQ. And Pretty much as in the case of, of, uh, of the plane, where this is actually a kind of special case when we take this M to be R, and this is one jet space of, t of, of R. Um, so we, we can also here use, uh, we can find, so uh, <coughs> pull back the almost complex structure from an almost complex structure on T star M. So in other words, we take an almost complex structure on T star M, the, the contact planes maps again isomorphically onto the tangent place of T star M, and we pull it back to the contact planes and extend it in the usual way in the other direction. And then we have a, we have a similar description uh, of of the holomorphic curve. So, uh, so again, so ho holomorphic, holomorphic disks. Uh, now correspond to holomorphic polygons uh, of the same nature, but now uh, with boundary on uh, on the projection of lambda, which is now a Lagrangian submanifold, right? Inside this T star M. 
So basically, it's the same, it's the same thing as for nodes. But now, now our Lagrangian is higher dimensional. And, and it still has uh, some number of double points. And we, we have to find out how to count the polygon. So, uh, but first thing to observe is that the, wherever it went, here, that the, this notion of positive negative coordinates is exactly the same, right? So you have a crossing, and that at the positive puncture, it goes up the rave cord, and at the negative, it goes down. So, so we have somehow exactly the same dictionary. And now the question is, how can one possibly count these things? So here, we somehow we're lucky in the sense that we're basically using Riemann mapping theorem. But when the ambient space has higher dimension, there is no such easy way to find all the holomorphic curves. But uh, the idea is that one can degenerate uh, the Lagrangian towards the zero section. So let me try to explain this. Tobias, could you raise the board that's behind, please? Sure. So, so now we have some uh, projection of lambda sitting inside uh, T star M. And, uh, you know, the idea is the following, that if here we have the zero section uh, of M, and then this lambda somehow uh, is exact Lagrangian submanifold here, over here. And now what we want to do is we want to, f to scale. So we, we take the, uh, we have some almost complex structure, and then we scale. So, so you know, you take Q comma P, and you map it to Q comma, uh, maybe I take sigma times P, where, where sigma is tending to zero. So what happens <clears throat> is, of course, that this thing is getting skinnier and skinnier and gets closer and closer to zero section. And, uh, and uh, then one can prove that the holomorphic curves, so, so the basic case of this is very old, and uh, due to Fleur, that the holomorphic curves, uh, when, when you have a graphical one, they correspond indeed to gradient flow lines of the function difference that this, this uh, graphical thing defines, right? So uh, when you have more complicated things like here, then you cannot say that they correspond to gradient flow lines, but rather they would correspond to gradient flow trees, which locally have locally have the, the uh, looks like a gradient flow line, but then it's, it, it, it's a, some sort of tree that is being, uh, being drawn. So, so let me try to, to explain what, what those are. So I, I'm probably not going to finish that explanation today, but anyway, I can start. So, uh, so that's somehow the main, next main subject of what I'm going to try to, to explain. So this is called gradient flow trees. And I will have to wait till next time. But what I can explain is at least the, the grading formula. Uh, the grading. So when you have this Lagrangian inside the one jet space of M, we projected it to, uh, to T star M, which was somehow holomorphically important. But we can also projected to the zero jet space of M, which is just M times R. And there, it looks, what happens when you project the Lachandrian is uh, that you get the front. And so, um, and so, so, so here is R, and here is this M. And for example, the un that we drew before has the following front. And the intersection points Self-intersection points, uh, the, well, how to reconstruct. So here we reconstruct the Q, P coordinate, PI, is equal to the partial derivative of C with respect to QI, where, where somehow, you know, where you locally you have a graph, then you have certain singularities, which I'm not going to talk too much about right now. 
But at least you can see that the double points, they correspond to uh, points on the front. This is a little bit too good, but anyway, points on the front where the tangent planes are parallel, right? So, so here there's one chord in the middle. And now I want to give you the grading formula. Uh, so the grading of such a rave chord A is equal to should say one more thing, that the singularities, singularities of this front, they have, they are not so hard to describe in low co-dimension. The lowest, the highest uh, strata of the singularities are so-called cusp edges. So they look like that, it's a semi-cubical cusp, so C squared is equal to X cubed is the local thing here, and then you just multiply it by R in the other direction. And the, those are all the singularities in co-dimension one. So if I pick a path from top to bottom, then I will hit only, only these type singularities. No kind of this co-dimension two, anything I don't have to describe. And the grading of A is the number of down cusps. So that means that I go down the cusp in the C direction, minus the number of up cusps. Um, is it the opposite way with the arrows? It's the opposite way with the arrows. So I go up in the C direction, plus the Morse index. So the Morse index here is uh, I have a critical, if I take the difference, the top minus the bottom, I have a critical point of some function. And the degeneracy condition is that this is a Morse function. I take the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, and then I subtract one. So for the unknot here in the picture, you see I start here, I go down one cusp, that's one, and I have one for the Morse index, that's two. And so then I subtract one, I get my one back. Okay, so then I, we can expand, I will stop at this, but we can expand, you can now do next exercise without any kind of calculation. So you can compute the higher, so the higher dimensional unknot is this thing, which is a, now here, here this is an, oops, here you have n dimensions, right? x1 up to xn, and this is z. This is the front, so this is an Sn minus 1 uh, cuspidal edge. And uh, so compute. And so here, here you can just compute because you don't, okay, don't have to know anything about trees or anything at all. So you can compute the DGA very easily. Okay, so, so I will stop at this and continue uh, on Wednesday and then I, I will continue first with the trees and then somehow try to cover more material. Thank you. All right, any questions for Tobias? Can you just say where the Morse index comes from in the picture again? Uh, yeah, so the Morse, so in general here, so when, when you have, when you're at the point in the base where you have the two parallel tangent planes, if you look at the function, which is the difference of the upper graph and the lower graph, then you have a function which has a critical point at that point, and that's a Morse critical point, you can take the Morse index of that with, with, with the, the positive function difference, so the top of the ray minus the... Yeah. I don't think the, the right most the double points should probably uh, change that example, the, the exercise. What is it? The, the exercise, the, the, the trefoil. The trefoil. The right most is wrong, thank you. Yeah, you should go down when you go positive. Thank you, yes. Sorry. Yes. Somehow, some convention that needs to be the same at both ends. But <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, like your theory, it's um, if you have a how to say it, sort of a hypercircus and M cross R, and then you tell me something about it. What if I took that whole thing and I just multiplied it by a trivial factor? Yeah. Uh, you go up a dimension by taking. Uh, that hypercircus <coughs> one. Mm -hmm. So the, how, how does the theory change? The same theory or is it? No, so, so if you multiply it by S1, then uh, the theory changes. It's actually one of my next exercises I want to give. But, but indeed, the theory changes. So, so, you ha so basically, uh, over this S1, you have when you, so when you just multiply, you get the front with very degenerate things. So you have kind of these fa S1 families, right? So you have to perturb it away. So you get one 
something sitting over the minimum, something sitting over the maximum. Over the minimum, you have exactly a, a copy of what you had before. And over the maximum, you get, um, so, so, so here, here somehow I have a sort of a generator A hat, corresponding generator A here. And when I want to compute this D A hat, then I get, let's say, gamma of D A. So this, what is this D A? D A is equal to some sum of monomials, B1, B2, up to Bm. And, and the gamma of a monomial up to size. So let me forget about signs. So it's doing the following. So it's B1 hat, B2, Bm, plus B1, B2 hat, B3, Bm, plus, and then so it goes. So I just move the hat once. So it's like some kind of homotopy operator, if you wish. So that's what, 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 what it does when you multiply by S1. And when you multiply by R, you kind of have to choose whether you want to live here or you want to live here. So it's, it's not so clear. You have to say what you do at infinity. Okay. All right, how about we thank Tobias again? <laughs>